A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Wheelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Wheelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT. Our personal information is under attack, but could our kids be the ones who help protect us all in the future? And nature's way to mitigate the flood, a marsh's mission in the cities. We've talked about flood recovery in downtown areas, rural farm fields, and neighborhoods, but wetlands took a hit as well. The recovery at Nahant Marsh and an idea to make it grow, that's just ahead. But first, cybersecurity is no longer something that can only be a concern of IT teams. We all need to know how to protect ourselves and a two-day Quad City conference helping people take a big step forward. And joining us is John Johnson and Shadrick Roberts, founding members of the Quad City Cybersecurity Alliance and the organizers of the fifth annual Quad City Cybersecurity Conference and Kids Hacker Camp, better known as CornCon. It's coming up Friday, September 6th and Saturday, September 7th at the Rogalski Center on the campus of St. Ambrose University. And thank you both for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you for having us here. Where did this conference idea come from? I mean, especially the Kids Hacker Camp, I think is the most interesting too. Well, uh, to start off with, about 10 years ago, Shad and I formed the Quad City Cybersecurity Alliance. And uh, we wanted to raise the bar in the community, raise awareness about security with local businesses. And then about five, five years ago, we started our um, uh, started CornCon, our cybersecurity conference, and uh, the the intention there was really to raise public awareness and to uh, bring what we learn from these big conferences when we're in Las Vegas and San Francisco and wherever, and bring it to the Quad Cities so that we can help the local businesses. Um, for the last nine years, I've been uh, helping organize the program at DEF CON, which is a big hacker conference in Las Vegas every summer that we go to, um, organizing the, uh, the kids program there. And so I decided we need to bring that back and make that a part. When we start our conference here, we're going to have the kids camp as well. And it's just, they've, they fit together real well. We want to get kids involved at a young age to think cybersecurity might be fun, it might be a career. Hacking is not a bad thing as long as you're an ethical white hat hacker working for the good guys. And, uh, you know, we want to get uh, high school kids into the pipeline, going to college, learning about cybersecurity, and then help, uh, help people move into cybersecurity as a potential career um, throughout the whole life cycle. Well, Shad, let's talk about just the last five years. The way technology has expanded, it's mind boggling. I mean, what have you noticed just in the five years of CornCon, let alone the 10 years since the Alliance has been around? I mean, just so much has changed. We are in a world now where the kids, you know, basically have an, uh, they've grown up with the internet. And I think the smartphone devices and stuff like that, it, we're just in so much more of an interconnected world at this point that um, it just keeps changing faster and faster. And, and I think, you know, technologically or, or economically, there are a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of potential for people to have great careers in this field. Um, I would say we live more in a Silicon Valley is what I like to say, it's the Silicon Valley here. So people don't think of that. And a lot of times we lose a lot of our best talent to the coast. You know, Iowa, Iowa State have great programs and they graduate people and they don't think there are, are opportunities here. Um, so, you know, we have really just tried to, as John said, take that like from cradle to grave, start the kids early. You'll find out that some of these kids are far more advanced than you would ever have guessed. I, but I wouldn't, to be perfectly honest, because I sit there and I think generationally two things. One is, like you said, they grew up with it. The second thing is, they believe that all of their information is out there anyway, whereas a generation such as mine is still somewhat in denial in this belief that, oh, I'm not going to give away a password or something like that because then they'll know something about me when they may already know. Yeah, we are, I do say that uh, today in the digital domain, like privacy is like a bit of a facade. And the reality is, I mean, you see it in local news every day and national news about breaches and things that have occurred. And all these things are a cause for alarm and things that we need to be aware of. But uh, the idea that you haven't had your privacy breached or something like that hasn't occurred uh, previously is kind of, a, you know, a bit of a, I would say, as you said, we're in denial 
reality is it's happening every day. And these are just the things we hear about. Yeah, well, so. that's exactly it. And it is a bit of a misnomer to think that you have total privacy right now or that somehow you're off the grid and you're not somehow known. Yeah. I guess that could be a good thing or a bad thing because I know in so many different ways the Facebooks of the world or let's say even the large chain stores want to see what you're buying so they better stock their stores and that way the, the, some people would say, oh, I understand for marketing sense the l lack of privacy, but in so many other ways, they know way too much about us. Yeah, we don't want to give away our technology. We want to keep our technology right. We want to have more technology that's better, that uh, makes our companies more profitable, that lets us connect with our friends better. Um, and so we don't want to go backwards. Um, but to move forwards, we've probably got a shortage of a million cybersecurity jobs that are unfilled here in the U.S., and that's going to double in the next two years. And so we need to get people into the pipeline and realize if we can get smart people in there working on this problem, we can solve anything. Because let's be honest, it is a problem that's not going to go away. That's right. And it's only going to get trickier and trickier and better and better on both sides, that's I right. assume. That's right. We're also noticing, especially when it comes to government and defense, we're talking about business and industry. I'd assume that there's government jobs all over the all over the planet as well. Oh yeah, I mean there, there's a. I mean the bottom line is in this space, if you enjoy it and you like it, there's jobs in, you know, there's jobs in the private sector, there's jobs in academia, there's jobs um, with. I work myself in a uh, day job for Department of Defense. Um, there's definitely, you know, there's a shortage across the board. In fact, it is so competitive that it's hard to acquire talent. I mean. If you are in this field and you have the, the skills that someone is looking for, you can almost name your price, which is why I think, you know, locally we felt after going out to these places that were a little bit more advanced or had been doing this longer, we're like, we can do this on a smaller, uh, a bite size or a smaller version here locally. Um, the program that it's, that John works with a few other friends is called Roots at DEF CON and we do our own kind of mini flavor or version of that here in the Quad Cities. So the kids are really the future. They understand the technology, and perhaps they understand the next phase of the technology better than we do. But what about people that are a little bit older? We just had a report of uh, hacking over the last weekend at a credit union. And, and that, so it always seems like when it comes to a lot of people, just stay out of my finances and my medical records. And that seems to be where so many breaches are occurring. Yeah, well, I'll say the, the two places uh, that are the most common are going to be over the phone the robocallers who try to scam you, and uh, through email, where they try to get you to click on something. Uh, those are the most common, and so, uh, the, you know, basic awareness, being a little skeptical, works, but the neat thing about uh, the CornCon Kids Hacker Camp is they have to stay with their parents the whole day. Somebody has to, they have to have a guardian there. And so their parents are there with them, whether they're soldering their badge, whether they're um, learning how elections can get hacked, uh, whether they're coding, and their parents are the ones who are really learning yeah, I would at think this so. kids camp. There's definitely a lot of that. Well, and, and let's talk about that because in so many different ways the kids are going to be teaching the parents. That's right. So is that what you're kind of hoping that will happen at the conference? I think it's, you know, it, it's full uh, duplex. I mean, the parents learn and the kids learn. I mean, I think we've created cybersecurity professionals in their 40s and 50s. Uh, people kind of decide, hey, I, I can't be a truck driver anymore, but I've always been analytical and there's a lot of uh, like I said, I, th I think it's inspired both directions. Um, and I was just say, I want to add on the other thing. The other one that's been local a lot lately is when you're talking about financial uh, crimes and identity theft is a lot of the, the basics of like just card skimming. And exactly. you were talking about giving advice. I, I always tell people never use your uh, debit card. You know, you use a credit card because then you're only liable to $50 maybe. And I myself have had to change my credit card at least like 20 times. Just an easy tip like that can save a lot of people money. Yeah. yeah. The, but, but is it also a problem, let's be honest, is that, hey, my credit union, my bank will reimburse me if it happens. There's no loss to me. Sometimes, not always. Um, it's, you know, the, I would say locally the, the situations or the, you know, anything that we've had happen locally, I've heard positive things about the local credit unions doing that, but it, there is no uh, guarantee that that would be the case. You know, with, with credit cards, it is um, financially insured. And, and honestly, the industry is so good at it because it happens so often mm -hmm. that, you know, they usually are emailing you or calling you or locking your card down. And then you discover it at the most, you know, inopportune time. And but in the grand scheme, it's such a cost to society, maybe not to the individual, but to the entire society. <laughs> sure. You were talking about there could be good hackers and bad hackers, and there's a quote that you have, you have a responsibility to promote safety, privacy, and security. That's what you're saying to, what, 
this generation and future generations, any, anybody who uses a computer, so to speak? That, that's right. Um, if, you, if you understand technology, you have you know, kind of an ethical duty to, to use it appropriately and to you know, help other people. And so we tell the kids that you have a superpower and you need to use this superpower for good, not for bad. And there are a lot of bad people out there trying to do bad things. But, uh, but there's a path that you can take as a white hat hacker. We want to encourage kids to be curious. We want to encourage them to try things. We want to encourage them to stay within the boundaries of the law, but to have a good time. And, uh, and so I think that if they don't have any guidance, it's very easy to, to stray off that path. Oh, very, so we're, yeah. we're trying to provide them some guidance. And, uh, and of course, their teachers and their parents and you know, everyone else is as well. Well, and let's be honest, 20, 30 years ago, being involved in IT or being involved in hacking, you were thought of as the nerd that was upstairs 20 years old <laughs> in their bedroom True. late at night, yeah. coding and, and, and doing whatnot. It's not that way anymore. It's, it's kind of like, um, like to further on what John was saying, you, the nerds have kind of like taken over. All the big companies, all this stuff that, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these you know, the economic where we are today, were started by people out of their garage as an, as an entrepreneur and they're using the technology. I always look at it like the technology is just a tool and it can be used for good, it can be used for bad. Um, the, the best defenders I have found are ones that know how to think like the ones that are you know, out to do bad. You, you almost have to outsmart them, of Correct. course. It's like, a, it's like a game of chess. That's, it, it never really ends and you're constantly trying to stay ahead of them and just slow them down enough you know, to to just stay just slightly ahead of the power curve. Which is critically important, but does that mean that our schools have to be better at what they're teaching? I mean, we're, we're, we're focusing a little more on STEM education. We're getting there, I guess, baby steps, but it sounds like we need more than baby steps here. Yeah, a lot of schools are introducing computer science, and um, I know that Project Lead the Way is big here in the Quad Cities with some of the schools. Um, I work with another Alliance um, nonprofit and we developed some curriculum that goes along with Project Lead the Way to try to introduce cybersecurity. But yeah, the younger you can start to get them thinking that way, the better. John Johnson, Shadrick Roberts, thank you both for joining us. We want to remind you, they are the founding members of the Quad Cities uh, Cybersecurity Alliance. But once again, it's the fifth annual Quad Cities Cybersecurity Conference and Kids Hacker Camp, better known as CornCon, Friday, September 6th, Saturday, September 7th at the Rogalski Center on the campus of St. Ambrose University. Nobody will be turned away, but you can register at corncon.net. So check into it right now. Still to come, we're lucky to have had a marsh along the Mississippi River this year. How it went along way to easing some of the damage caused by the flood of 2019. But first, Laura Adams has a lot of ideas to get your September started in style. Here's some ideas you may want to consider if you're going out and about. This is Out and About for September 2nd through 8th. Labor Day activities include the 35th annual Rock Island Labor Day Parade at 9.30, the 25th anniversary of the Run with Carl starting at 7.30 in Bettendorf, the 37th annual East Moline Labor Day Parade starting at 11 a.m., and the Labor Day Weekend Festival at Dan Nagel Walnut Grove Pioneer Village in Long Grove September 1st and 2nd. Plus, get ready to visit the 66th Bow Arts Fair at the Figgy Art Museum September 7th and 8th, or check out the Grand Detour Arts Festival at the John Deere Historic Site in Dixon on the 8th. Viva Quad Cities, the annual fiesta that celebrates the Latino culture, takes place at LeClaire Park on the 8th, while the Quad Cities River Bandits Race to Home 5K will be held at Modern Woodman Park September 7. Or check out trains, planes, and automobiles at the Geneseo Downtown Car Show on the 7th. Plus, it's time for the John Deere Heritage Tractor Parade and Show September 7th in Moline. And let the tradition begin at our Big Fat Greek Festival at St. George Greek Orthodox Church September 6th and 7th. On stage, Time Stands Still at Galvin Fine Arts Center at St. Ambrose University performs September 5th and 6th. Or meet Pulitzer finalist and award-winning author Rebecca Mackay on September 9th at 6.30 at the Moline Public Library. For more information, visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. Murray Lee Rice is part of the four-man group Rude Punch, but he joined us at the Black Box Theater in Moline to show us some of his solo work. Here's Murray Lee Rice with Happy or the Unnecessary Need to Self-Destruct. But I'm used to 
gravel roads I'm finally on a straightaway Why am I waiting for this car to explode? They say happiness suits someone Why does it feel so off on me? I've just been beaten down for so long This is such a new feeling And I'm scared that it's going to leave me I'm finally out of the deep end to water shallow and pure set you free why do I feel like I'm drowning I've just been swimming for so long these shallow waters worry me and I'm scared Murray Lee Rice from the group Rude Punch with happy or the unnecessary need to self-destruct. You can't be blamed for driving along Davenport's far southwest side not noticing Nahant Marsh. There's no neon signs, no big billboards, nor should there be, let's be honest. But Nahant Marsh played a big role in the flood of 2019 and continues to play a big role in our ecology, including work to bring back butterflies to our area. And joining us is the executive director of the Nahant Marsh, Brian Reuter. Thanks so much for joining us. Let's start with the flood. I mean, there's two things that Nahant Marsh did. One was it suffered the wrath of high waters yeah. for three months. The other thing is it mitigated in some ways the flood further downriver. Let's start with the impact of the marsh. Well, um, it, it, I'd say it's still actually too early to tell. Okay. So we, we, uh, we were underwater. Nahant starts taking on water from the river when it gets to 12 feet on the Rock Island Gauge. So we started taking on water Very around my, March 15th and we had water well into June. And so 100 days, um, some of our areas have bounced back just fine. They look great. Other areas, it's questionable whether they're gonna return, especially what seems to be hard hit all along the Mississippi River corridor, the woodlands. The trees are really looking bad, and chances are a lot of those trees are going to die out. I'd assume because the roots got waterlogged yeah. and there was no oxygen for the... Right, they were just underwater for way too long. Um, in terms of our infrastructure, we did pretty okay. We, we, were at, we had a ton of volunteers show up at the last second and help sandbag our building, which was incredible. It kept the water out. Um, we own we own a home in a in a garage on uh, South Concord, which is right in the main flowway. Always flowing. that got some damage, and we're going to have to do some repairs to that. But for the most part, once the water got out of there, we got up and running, and and we we're kind of fine. The the thing that hurt us most, I would say, is the fact that we had to cancel 
probably a couple thousand, uh, well, several dozen school groups and, and other groups and probably missed out on several thousand people coming to the marsh during our busy season. Tell me how the marsh did help mitigate. I, I know the people like yeah. in Buffalo and people even further down river are saying, thank heavens for Nahant Marsh. Yeah, well, uh, what's remarkable, like I mentioned, when the river gets to 12 feet, it starts backing in. Flood stage is 15 feet, so well before that. We estimate, uh, and this is calculations through the city of Davenport and others, that we took on about one trillion gallons of water during the flood, and that's equivalent of 1.5 million Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of water that came in and um, essentially prevented that from being forced downstream. Now, if you think about that, along Davenport's riverfront and Rock Island's riverfront, historically, there would have been wetlands just like Nahant all over the place and uh, those have largely been filled in. So had Nahant been filled in, and it, there was the risk years Absolutely. ago, um, that all that water would have been forced into Buffalo, Andalusia, and other things. Well, and then you talk about the Mayor Frank Klitsch's uh, task force, and one of the things that they've been talking about is more natural ways to at least diminish the impact of mm -hmm. floods. You're never gonna get, completely get rid of them. Right. And, and to allow for more wetlands and for more marshy areas, right. I'm, I assume that's something, of course, you support. Yeah. Is there land for that? I mean, is there areas that you're looking at? Well, yeah, I, and at Nahant, you know, we, we own 305 acres. Uh, there's probably another 400 acres of wetlands just in our neck of the woods that could be protected. And so we're definitely looking in that direction, but um, it has to be a bigger, has to be a bigger initiative across our entire landscape in the upper Midwest. Nahant is not gonna save downtown Davenport by itself. Um, we need to look further upstream and figure out where those areas are that we can have the most impact by building wetlands. Key also for the environment, even when there's not a flood. And one mm -hmm. of the reasons why is that we're talking about nature making a comeback. You are yeah. uh, instrumental in trying to get the monarch butterfly to come back. Yeah. You've got an event that's coming up. Tell me a little bit about this monarch release because you've done it for four years. Yeah, so it's uh, September 14th and it's a great family friendly event. Um, but the bigger issue is we're trying to educate people about, number one, why is this species dwindling so quickly? The populations have dropped 90% in the past 20 years, and that's pretty alarming. Uh, it's, it's kind of the canary in the coal mine, though. It is, Mo it? Monarchs are just the tip of the iceberg. But um, like I said, it's a family-friendly family event. We're gonna release over 200 monarchs that day. And when we release them, the families will have an opportunity to put a tag on them, and they can track that monarch's um, movement hopefully all the way to Mexico. I, I find that so hard to buy. I know, you're, you're smiling because you know I am just, I can't believe it. So it's a little sticker on the wing of a monarch. It is. And you can track where that monarch goes with whoever finds the monarch at whatever that destination point is. Right, yeah, so, it, and it has, shows to have no impact on the monarch's flight or anything like that. It's a tiny little sticker. It's got an ID number on it and it's got a place where you can log in. And so if somebody finds that monarch down in Oklahoma or even Texas or Mexico, they can log that monarch in and say, hey, we found this here. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully they re-release it and it can continue its journey. And so it's been a really effective way of monitoring monarch populations and their success or lack thereof. And uh, it's Monarch Watch that um, really is the the sort of guiding organization that does this. Is there a bit of a comeback now? I mean, are my eyes deceiving me? Because no, I was talking to you earlier that it seemed like there were more butterflies. Yeah, so. yeah, I mean, this year was a, a much better year than the past five or 10. Uh, and there's evidence that the monarch population rose over the winter. They, they count them, they do surveys down in Mexico and the numbers were higher in, in Mexico this year. And they, that seems to translate to a better year this year. We were definitely seeing more monarchs and, and other pollinators in general around on our landscape this year. And I think it's a combination of different initiatives. There's a lot of people planting helpful plants and all those other things. There's more awareness, let's be honest. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, there's been a big push, don't just put lawns down, put right. some type of uh, uh, plant life that'll help uh, the pollinators such as bees and as you say, butterflies. That, that's right, you know, if you think about it, in the United States, we have about 40 million acres of lawn. Now, if everybody just took five or 10% of their 
backyard and planted some native wildflowers and milkweed and things like that, boy, that's four million new acres of habitat that we didn't have. Four million acres you wouldn't have to mow, too. Right. <laughs> Think of the time that would save. <laughs> Absolutely. You could spend more time at Nahan Marsh. That's right. Brian Ritter, Executive Director of Nahan Marsh, thanks so much for joining Thank us. You. We appreciate it. And once again, the fourth annual Nahan Marsh release party, Saturday, September 14th. The release is scheduled for noon, but there are family events throughout the day. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device, thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Wheelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Wheelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT.